Welcome back to the Research Park Big Data Summit. Some of us are in the networking session, and that's a great opportunity to connect students and professionals with potential work opportunities. And one of the employers in the research park that's done an exemplary job building careers and teaching students to really think about the next phases of data and automation has been Synchrony and the Synchrony Emerging Technology Center. They've since opened, uh, doubled the size of their operations and engaged many students across different disciplines in thinking about digital transformation, computer vision projects, and new ways to think about e-commerce for the future. And as we have had a challenging year, there's also been a refocus on how we think about digital payments. This is a company really at the forefront of that. And they have been working with students, as I had mentioned, to think about the future of retailers and the future of your wallet. So with that, I'm really pleased to have joining us today, Abhijit Chennai, and he is the Senior Vice President of Analytics Capabilities and Business Development at Synchrony. He began his career at PwC and IBM, focusing on technology operations, and he also worked with Barclays before coming to this position in international roles. He is now working on data sciences across Synchrony, and he's going to talk to us about the customer experience and how they're really changing things with new innovation. So thanks for joining us. Great. Good afternoon, and thanks, Laura, for the introduction. Um, as Laura mentioned, I lead analytics capabilities for Synchrony, uh, which is uh, part of our customer experience and analytics function within the bank. Um, and so for those who may not be still unfamiliar with Synchrony, even after that wonderful introduction is, you know, we're basically a top 10 credit card issuer in the US. Um, and we have private label and co-grant card programs with partners such as Amazon, PayPal, Sam's Clubs, just to name a few. And so as you think about that consumer financing relationship that Synchrony really offers, um, my team's role is to help identify solutions to business problems and really partner with analysts and data scientists to find creative ways to solve them. So in the next sort of 20, 30 minutes, I'll kind of provide a, a high level overview of how to think about the customer experience and innovation um, and really bring that to life with a, with a real life case study um, using big data and analytics. So what is customer experience innovation? Um, there's quite a few nuanced definitions that are out there. Um, I, I kind of picked one that I really like the most, um, which is, you know, experiences that make international uh, interactions totally natural, useful, easy, and seamless. Uh, putting yourself really in the customer's shoes to listen uh, to what their needs are, what they want, and how do we develop products and services um, that really, really make their lives easier um, and, and wow them. And so, you know, in an, in an academic standpoint, you may have heard about or taken courses in design thinking, human-centered design and service design. And that's essentially what we're talking about. Um, there's many ways and flavors how companies make them their own, make this their own. Um, and so we really uh, practice that here at Synchrony. What I thought I'd do is uh, maybe just share a quick video on, on um, design thinking, because there's no better way to bring this to life for that example um, of uh, defining design thinking. And then I'll move on to um, a case study that we recently completed. Uh, so bear with me while I uh, work through the technology here to stop and share the video.
Okay, so I think we tried the video, but no worries if that doesn't work. We'll, uh, we'll uh, get on with the presentation. Sorry about that. I thought uh, that was sorted. Can you guys hear me okay? We hear you. And so we'll just get the human centered design. Uh, yeah, permit. we'll make it human. We'll, we'll let the, we'll, we'll put the human back in it. So the long and short of what we were trying and maybe saw through the illustration was really um, how do we, how do we think about starting with the customer at the heart of what we do? And that starts with customer research. Um, and, and this really requires doing um, interviews or conversations with our customers in their natural habitat. Um, and so the case study that I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about today is called Fraud Disputes. Um, for those who may have ever experienced it, if you have a credit card and you recognize a transaction uh, or you see a transaction that you don't recognize, um, you, you would have to go through a dispute process. And so um, it, the, the service design element that we brought into it was really doing the research where we and interviewed our customers that had a fraud on their cards with Synchrony, which is, uh, as you can imagine, a tough thing to do um, if that experience has taken place. But we met with them in their natural habitat, in their homes, actually, in their places of work where they were comfortable um, to really find out what were they were thinking, what they were feeling, what, where were they when they reported fraud. And from there, we started to develop segments or personas um, to classify a group of customers based on a set of different demographics, based on a set of experiences to say what those common emotions or sentiments were. And you effectively take that and we map it to a journey, which wing to wing started to think about where was I when I saw a fraud dispute? Um, what did I do next? Um, did I hear from Synchrony Bank? Um, and so these are elements as you think about design thinking by really not looking at it from your service or process or technology lens of how you'd solve a problem, but kind of working backwards to lay out that journey. And as you take and you uh, take and collect all these different data points, um, you start to basically uh, evaluate them and co-create through ideas. And this concept of co-creation, which I'll talk to you in a little bit more detail in about a minute, is so powerful um, because the whole, uh, the whole concept is to bring not only the customer, but different parts um, of the organization um, that may not have traditionally played a role in solving these problems into the dialogue. Um, so in the case of fraud, for example, um, you, know, you may have typically thought, well, I'm going to bring in the technologist. I'm going to bring in someone from the fraud department. What we ended up doing was we actually ended up bringing in someone from um, the customer service organization that works in billing. We ended up some, bringing somebody who focuses on UX UI um, and really cross pollinating the talent to think about what is it that we can do to address these pain points and create concepts. How do you rapidly prototype these concepts and fail fast? Um, so you're not waiting all the way to build something uh, but really trialing different ideas. And the ones that really stick, how do you prioritize and execute? So the video was just basically a little bit more um, articulate way through a coffee shop example that was um, bringing to life the conversations and the dialogues around design thinking. Um, as, as I was talking about frost disputes, here's what we did at Synchrony in this real life example where um, again, we talked to our customers who had experienced fraud. And in there, we interviewed them. Um, we met with cross-functional leaders, frontline agents. We did side-by-side -side call listening um, to understand what were the challenges they were having with reporting fraud, why they thought they, a transaction was fraudulent, for example. And we looked at VOC surveys from agents in terms of a post call, how was that performance? Was that cost satisfactory or not? What is it that worked and didn't work? And so these are critical elements that started to, again, start to lead with the customer in mind. Um, and we complemented that with process data, right? Which is, should a dispute, for example, come, come to be, how many of those cases are decisioned in a customer's favor? What's the time to close a fraud investigation, right? Um, does it take a week? Does it take 10 days? Does it take 30 days? 
Um, we looked at regulatory complaints, which in a banking field is really important if there's a complaint that a customer makes uh, with an OCC or the Fed, that can come down to us um, and is something that's really important for us to pay attention to. Um, we started to map out what were the number of um, transactions that had fraud bucketed, bucketed by the number of days to resolve it and how long did it actually take for an agent to solve it. So all of this, again, is just an illustration of when you think about human-centered design, how do you start with the customer in mind, which is really the left side of this page, and then the right side of this page is how do you complement that with data where you can come together and build what we call as a customer journey map. And so um, the imagery here is uh, a bit poor, but um, the top part of this is what we built is a fraud journey map that goes all the way from the moment that a customer identified fraud to what they did, what were their pain points, what channels did they use, to where they communicated all the way through, um, through the experience of, is your fraud re uh, dispute resolved? Did they have to call in multiple times? Um, did they stop spending or using their credit card? Um, and when they were notified of the decision, was, was that satisfactory? How were they notified? Did they have to call back and ask for clarification? And once that was all done, were they able to go back and start spending on their card at the same levels prior to when they experienced this issue? And so this map is just a way to demonstrate that wing-to-wing -wing experience and tie that with all the things that Synchrony is doing in terms of the channels it uses, the letters, the communications in a map. And so we took that and we figured out what were the big areas of the biggest pain points uh, from a customer lens and how do we start solving those pain points? And so the bottom is again, it's just an illustration of cross-functional workshops that we had where we brought in uh, again, a variety of stakeholders that spent time over a day um, to co-create ideas um, and come up with concepts that could solve them. We came up with a dozen or so ideas. But the one that's important and why I'm talking to you today in the context of a big data summit is this idea of customer design thinking resulted in us um, thinking about building um, a machine learning model that could help solve fraud cases. And so the, really the concept here was, is if a customer calls in and says a transaction is fraudulent, today a, a human looks at it and, and it, can take, um, it can take up to 30 to 60 days um, to resolve a dispute. And so we started asking ourselves, well, how do we do it quicker? Because when we talked to the customers, their basic premise was, I just want this to be dealt with, I want it to be gone. Um, and so I can move on, I can feel good that I'm protected, my card is secure, and I can move on. So we thought about what are the ways in which we could decision these cases faster um, and quicker, should we have the right data available? And so the answer, again, is what we, what we internally within Synchrony call the fraud investigation decision engine, where we started to analyze and look at all the data points working backwards from the investigator, what they look at to determine, is that available to us? Can we take all those different elements and put them in a big data ecosystem um, and play with them on our data lake um, to see if we can create some kind of an indication within those data points, if something is fraudulent or not to decision a case versus having to someone manually work it. And so really the outcome here was what we ended up building was a random forest model um, that looked at 200 plus variables, created some 500 trees and created an output that was interpreted as fraud or not fraud. And that was really powerful because this is the first time that we were able to take uh, a process um, that is highly manual, highly intensive and customer facing and apply data and analytics to it. And the biggest learning coming out of all of this was even though you do data science and analytics to solve business problems, how do you actually integrate it into a business process? How do you make it so that the way things are working today um, can work differently um, in the future because we still have agents involved, 
we have regulatory oversight, um, we have to think about our communications that go out to our customers. And so we built a robotics process around it, um, where as outputs were coming out of our models, we were able to update downstream applications um, and our email channels to really trigger what the agents needed to know internally, but also send out the emails to the end customer or sending them an alert, notifying them that that transaction had been resolved. And so here, the really the power of big data was how do we, how do we take a business problem, starting with the customer in mind, how do you analyze that problem? And how do you creatively think about solutions that in here, in our, in our mind, was a bit of a win-win-win because you're helping the customer um, get resolved their dispute faster. It's a win for synchrony because we're also driving operational savings um, and, and, and directing our workforces to really work on the more uh, difficult fraud cases. And it's a win for our partners like an Amazon or a Sam's Club where we get the customers back to spending um, at their store locations. So that's about the content that I had. My video is about five minutes, but I'll kind of take a pause here and, and see if folks have questions. Sorry about that, I was muted. Thanks Abhijit for sharing that information about the fraud example. We have a question from the audience. How does automation frustrate your customers and how does it help serve their needs more quickly? Uh, well, I think, I mean, this is an example of how um, automation is helping behind the scenes um, to really, uh, you know, evolve our business processes in the interest of helping the customer get resolution when they're in a difficult spot, right? Where there's an unknown, I don't know what a transaction is, um, or my credentials compromised, I'm not, I'm gonna stop spending. Um, and so here's a great example of both data science and automation behind the scenes helping them. I think when you think about what are some of the more um, topical examples where automations can be frustrating, and we may have seen that with things like chatbots, for example, right? where if a chatbot is not well trained across a set of topics or chatbots just starting out um, and that becomes an experience that you put right in front and center of a customer and is the limited option that they can interface with you, that can become frustrating because ultimately the human desires to speak to somebody uh, depending on the severity of the problem. And so I think in those instances, you know, we've learned and we have, we have a chatbot that we've trained over the last two to three years and evolve that, but we've managed it in such a way that you provide optionality for the customer to use channels that they're most comfortable with versus forcing them in an automated channel um, that is still um, you know, uh, new and growing. So I've heard during this year, there has been an increase of automation used in customer service, a challenge of having enough humans to do the work remotely. Are you seeing that have a reflection in your customer satisfaction? Um, is that something that I think Synchrony was really early to, to think about a lot of these types of bot experiences and hopefully improve them versus other companies? Any way that you can kind of talk about how to make that as, uh, as productive an ex as an experience as possible? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, just to, just make sure I just your question correctly, I was distracted with the little um, chat box that came up. The dialogue box that came up. I think I think the way to the way to make those experiences productive is by uh, by the the methodology that I shared early, earlier, which is um, try everything as an MVP. And I think that's really what we've started doing more and more of Synchrony is uh, you know um, a lot of companies uh, you know still follow a very traditional waterfall methodology. We start out with a technology project that's centered around automation. We think we know uh, what needs to get built. There's a massive Gantt chart with a project plan, all the integrations, and it can take six, eight, 12, you know, X many months to years to launch something. And yeah. I think what's improved our productivity and our efficiency is we really started embracing concepts of DevOps and Agile, where we are now bringing a lot of this design thinking into rapidly creating smaller structured stories um, and thinking about how do we build a service 
uh, oriented architecture or microservice oriented architecture that allows us to build smaller things that we can rapidly release, test, if it breaks, come back, fix it, um, but do that in a continuous fashion. And that's allowed us to internally be more productive, but it's also demonstrated that we can fail fast and launch products faster. Great, I've got a question from Brian at Riverbed. He's asking, what type of metrics were measured by the random forest algorithm and how were they dis decided on the number of trees to use? Great question, Brian. I'm not the data scientist. I'm probably not going to be able to answer your question um, fully, but what we started to do was, as we started looking at the features and the feature engineering that went under it, um, there's a set of uh, criteria that we had to go through. And again, because we're a bank and we're regulated, there are certain features we can use, there are certain features we cannot use. Um, and so there was a set of cutoffs that we had to go through and then there was basically a set of criteria to say what features drove the most predictability, right, around something being fraud or not. And so we rank ordered um, each of those features and ultimately decided on this list of 200. Um, in terms of the number of decision trees, it was effectively driven where there was a mark, incrementally there was little return in adding more trees and the complexity with which we would need to manage those algorithms was, was outweighing the cost of actually having it in there. So at a very high level, that was the rationale. Thanks. So Synchrony has been working on some robotic process automation applications from the Emerging Technology Center. What are some of the learnings that you've received from those experiences? We found that students can be really good at programming them. What advice would you have to other industries who are thinking about RPA adoption that you've experienced at Synchrony? Yeah, I think um, what, what I would do is I would kind of find uh, maybe you know a portfolio of projects that are, uh, if again, if you're at the conception a lot of this, a portfolio of projects that are um, de-risked, um, that allow you to innovate um, in a safe and a space way, right? Um, and, that, and those could be um, ideas that may not have, um, you know, the most uh, uh, and the highest level of funding behind it, but allow someone like, you know, students to come in and, it, and, and again, it becomes a bit of a win-win because it gives an opportunity for the students to really understand um, the commercial world and, in, and a specific set of industries while, the, while those companies in those industries experiment and see how innovation can truly transform their businesses um, in a safe way. And I think if you can find um, companies that are willing to test um, in a de-risked way with a couple of different ideas um, and also projects that um, aren't very large and broad and ambiguous in scope, right? Create well-defined short projects, um, take a month out to see what a deliverable could be test it and then try it again and then try it again. And I think it's really at the end of the day about the credibility and the trust that you put into it um, that moves some of these things forward. And so I think with Synchrony, you know, it, it's, we've had our own journey getting there, um, but I think, you know, the investments we've made um, at the technology park have been, have been great and really well received. So some of your retailer partners are actually in the research park, including Verizon, where Synchrony is the credit card issuer and BP. And some of these are retailers that are thinking about how their stores will change. How do you see digital commerce as transforming the shopping experience in the future or making it a, a better way to go back to retail physical operations? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's really top of mind and especially you know, in, our, in our current macro environment, um, even more so uh, than ever, um, as we've seen our business change um, and the footprint go on more online and more digital. You know, uh, you know, going with the theme of this presentation, I think it's about how do you harness the power of, of data based on the customer um, to really create those experiences that are unique and frictionless. And so um, not specifically with Verizon or BP, but with some of our other partners, uh, what we've started to do is um, see if we can create um, ecosystems where we can, where they can share information about their customers in a safe way, kind of non-PII related, but I, at a segmented level, so we know what those preferences are. And how do we take that data and those preferences to permeate them into the type of experience that we want to provide so that we know if your contact preference is digital, 
we want to try to enroll you in e-billing. If your contact preference is, um, you know, something around loyalty, how do we know uh, something about that loyalty information so we can curate the type of offers that we can send to you? So I think in the digital ecosystem, um, in many ways, it allows us to take a lot of that content um, and use data to mine it um, and also enable it and activate it through digital means that we previously couldn't do in the analog world because you couldn't necessarily do that at a sales counter. Right. And I'm guessing there've been some shifts and many people had loyalty cards that were in the travel industry, for example, and maybe the retailers are um, a winner in some of that as consumer, consumer behavior is changing this year. Uh, right. I thought I'd shift just as we wrap up in the last few minutes. I'd love to hear more of your personal journey, Abhijit. So the students, many of them are right now in our networking event and they'll have your recording to come back to as well. Um, as I said, Synchrony has been a great place to connect with students, especially in engineering and business fields on our campus. How did you come to have this type of career path as somebody who's leading analytics, but self-describes not a data scientist by background? Um, a little bit of luck uh, and a little bit of uh, figuring your way out uh, through the power of networking is, is the honest answer. Um, so uh, I, I think if, if I if I I feel like I'm in my third leg of my career, and so I really started out my career in technology, and at a heart I feel like I'm a technologist. Um, and so at, at IBM and PwC, I worked in, uh, in, in largely in large scale ERP CRM roles, uh, and so at the core of it, really understanding how software works and how software development works. Um, and I think that set a really good foundation for me. Um, to evolve through a set of roles in my career um, that span across, you know, strategy, client development, relationship management, to um, this unique space that we find ourselves in over the last decade in data and analytics, right? Um, that that brings together the power of all of these different elements with high compute um, to to really do that and activate it. And so, you know, at Synchrony, we realized that. Um, Within our organization, we have a data science and a decision management organization. We have a customer experience design organization. But what we wanted to also do is bring in um, somebody who could piece all that together and activate data in a way that drives commercial value. And so that was kind of the, the third or fourth leg, I like to think, um, that was kind of missing in, in many companies where data science can be cool, but it's hard to implement. Or you have a set of customer experience ideas, but you don't have the analytical backbone, whether it's through technology or the data or the resources or the platform to do it. And I think once you kind of find that marriage of what, what uh, chemistry works right for your organization, um, that's extremely powerful. So I feel fortunate that I happen to be in the right place uh, where that kind of my background married well uh, with what Synchrony was looking for. And last question, all day we've been hearing about data sciences across industries, across research domains, and many different interest areas. Why is financial services particularly a good area to apply those types of data skills and, and an exciting field to be a part of right now? Oh, it's, it's extremely rich. It's an extremely rich space to, to be in. Um, I mean, look, financial services is so broad. It's a bit like saying IT, right? I mean, you, uh, you could on a spectrum, you could have, you know, venture capitalists, hedge funds to the other side, you could have, you know, the old banks. And so I think you almost have to think about the role of data science when you say financial services, because you can apply that in many ways. You could be a quant person working for somewhere, or you could be within a consumer financing business, uh, doing building data science products the way we did here, which may not be as sexy as being with a, in, a, in, a, in a hedge fund, let's say. But the point is, is um, what we're seeing and investing heavily in is seeing the power of data to drive better decision-making every day. Whether you're underwriting a credit card application, whether you're thinking about how to service a customer better, whether you're thinking about how to do more targeted marketing. And the world is evolving where traditionally this has been used uh, using you know, SaaS code, and using data warehouses to really using the newer age tools um, like Python, right? Um, and using big data platforms to do this at scale. 
and we're just seeing more and more of it and we're seeing our partners ask for it. And so I think, you know, it's, it, it's a great time um, to be both in data science as well as um, in financial services. Thank you. Well, I think the students feel that way too. There seems to be a lot of enthusiasm about the category. So thank you, Abhijit Chennai, for joining us today and sharing your insights as a leader of Synchrony 